<clears throat> the subject today is printed in your bulletin. It's very easy, very simple. Some months ago, I, I gave a series of sermons, I think there were three or four of them, primarily from the book of Romans, dealing with the theology of Paul. The theology of Paul has not ceased. It continues. Many years ago, <clears throat> a great man in the history of the church said, I have two wishes. One is that I could have heard the apostle Paul preached. And the second would to have seen Rome in its imperial glory. That was St. Augustine's desire, wish, and hope. Today, we have the opportunity to hear Paul speak. The sermon titled in the bulletin is the title indeed. Paul speaks to us. There is a song in the hymnal that says the same thing. God speaks to us and we hope and trust that every week as we come here pay attention to the voice of the person speaking that God is indeed and in truth speaking to us never stops God continues to speak to his church and to speak to his people and we who speak to you Hope and trust and pray that God is speaking to you through us. Are you listening? So today, in a more specific fashion, Paul speaks to us. Many years ago, Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians. We first run into... Paul at Philippi in Acts chapter 16 when Paul was imprisoned for preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and we are still doing that today God remains faithful and God remains steadfast so Paul is speaking to the Philippians but this letter is similarly written to us. Turn then in your Bibles to the Philippians book, Epistle, beginning at chapter 1. And have it in your mind's eye that Paul has this great opportunity, so do we, to hear what Paul has to say. Paul and Timotheus which is an elongated term for Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at New York, Rockaway Boulevard. <laughs> <clears throat> That's exactly how we want it understood. Imagine that Paul is here, and he has a chance as was the desire of St. Augustine, to speak to us. What would Paul say to the bishops and the deacons and the laity in the congregation here today? His regular salutation would be, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice there's nothing here said about the Holy Spirit. In all of Saul's salutations, the opening remarks to the various churches, there is no mention when the twin personalities of the Godhead are addressed. There is no mention of the Holy Spirit 
in this salutation. Undoubtedly, we know that God's Holy Spirit is active, powerful, meaningful, real, and among us. There are many who spurn the idea that we teach <clears throat> that God's Holy Spirit is a power, it's a force, and it is not a person. There is no mention of the Holy Spirit in this salutation of Paul to us as there was none made to the Philippians. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So today, many years removed, Paul remembers us. Because God's truth and God's gospel and God's message was not simply for the Philippians, nor the Colossians, nor the Corinthians. He knew that God was going to call a host of people way beyond his time and his era. So here we are, listening to Paul as Paul speaks to us. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. In other words, he's happy to be here. He's happy to be addressing us as the people of God, as he did to the people in Philippi. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you might, hopefully, possibly, not Paul's words, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Brethren, therefore, Paul is saying, he who has begun that good work in you, that work of conversion, that work of being a part of the family of God, God's not going to forget you. God's not going to forsake you. God's not going to leave you. God will continue the work he's begun in you until the day of Jesus Christ. There are so many who get fed up, disconcerted, discombobulated. After a while, they've run wild, said Paul to the Galatians. But what ended you? Why did you get tired? Why did you drop out? God grant that we are not among those who drop out, but we are among those who will continue in this way until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all. In other words, he has confidence in us that we will be among those who endure to the end. Because I have you in my heart could you imagine Paul has us in his heart and his concerns? And as we get to another verse or two, you'll we'll see also in his presence, prayers. He's praying for us. He's concerned about our stick to itiveness that we will endure to the end until the day of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because I have you in my heart, it has much as both in my bonds and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. Remember, Paul was in prison. Somehow we got time to come with us here today. And he's saying, you're in my heart. I'm concerned about you, brethren. You're a part of the fellowship of God's family. When we feel that we are alone and we are forsaken and that the race is not worth running. 
Paul says, I have you in my heart, brethren. I endured to the end. I stuck with the path of God. And I want you to be partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And then he gets into his prayer. <clears throat> what is Paul praying for us, brethren? He starts this off here in verse 9. And this I pray. Now, wouldn't you have loved to have heard Paul pray? When Paul prayed, did the ceiling shake? And the walls rumble? Was his prayer repetitious? Is his prayer like ours? Bear in mind, brethren, that Paul was a man, as I said in James, with like passions, like vagrancies, like we are. He was a human being. This I pray. that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. Are you learning, brethren? Is your love being added to with common sense and with knowledge? Or do you love Helter Skelter? <laughs> Never Helter Skelter. Or is your love growing in knowledge and understanding? Are you understanding what you're doing? Is your love for me better than it was three years ago? Is my love for you an educated love? Am I understanding what I say when I say that I love you? When you say that, do I understand what you mean? The only evidence is what you show me. The only evidence is what I show you. You and I, brethren, have no space, no time to be unloving one to the other. And so he says, I pray that your love may abound, go to its widest possibility, more and more. In knowledge. Let's make our love knowledgeable. We think we understand what love is. Are we growing in that love? Do we appreciate each other more? This is the burden of Paul, first to the Philippians and then to the congregation here at Rockaway Boulevard that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Do we judge each other wrongly? Do we conclude the worst about our brethren? God says that our love should abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgments. <clears throat> it's very easy for us to say, we shouldn't judge anybody, but there must be a, an assimilation an assessment of each other. And he's saying that I trust and I hope and I pray that that's, that, that, that assimilation, that assessment is done in knowledge and judgment. That you approve things that are excellent. How easy and how great it is for us to approve and give ascendancy in the nod. There's some things that are not excellent. We hear something about somebody, and the first assessment is, oh yeah, I know her. I know him. Paul, as we come to the end of one year, calendar year, not God's year, He's saying, I hope you approve things that are excellent about Johnson and Dora and Felicia and Pam. 
Baldwin throw in these names because you know, I want you to realize it's real. This is not ethereal. If you prove things that are excellent, somebody comes to you and brings a story that you want to take with a grain of salt. Paul well, says, be careful. Only approve, acquiesce, accept things that are excellent about your brother. Somebody brings a story to you that doesn't sound like what she or he would have done in deed and the truth. You've got to assimilate it in your mind and only give excellent assessment of what you're saying, you're hearing. And you may be that you may be sincere. That's a point. Are you sincere? Are you sincere toward whoever it is? Paul is saying to us that we may be sincere. <laughs> What's the next stop? And without offense. Do you quickly give in to rumors about your brother and your sister? Paul wants us to be sincere. As we come to the end of one year, Paul wants us to strive to be sincere. And without offense, <laughs> till the day of Christ. That's a long way off. Paul thought that Christ would have come back in his day when he wrote to the Thessalonians. Everything was about at his coming. At his coming. The early century brethren thought that Christ would have come any time then. He hasn't come back yet. Thank God he hasn't. So we were not ready then. The question is, are we ready now? Do you give offense to others very easily? Paul says that we should be without offense. That is quite a holy estimation. How holy are you as we come to the end of one year? It is very easy for us to glibly say, I'm not holy. As though that's an accomplishment. As though that's a rack, a state that we want to continue in. I'm not holy. We know that God is coming back for a perfect church without spot. And without offense, holy. Hence, he's given us his Holy Spirit. That we might internalize the power of God. And strive earnestly, not flippantly, to live a holy life in the presence of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 11. Paul speaks to us. Listen to his voice. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, comma. How is your fruitage? Have you been bearing the fruits of Jesus Christ in your life? Have you been manifesting? As Paul enumerates them for the Galatians in Galatians 5 and 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Have you enjoyed much love, brother? Have you been growing in love that the fruits of righteousness might be seen in us? When you see me up and down the hall, do you see righteousness personified? Do I come over as having a nasty temper? Stay away from him, he might cuss you. 
that certainly is not the spirit of Christ. And that does not show the fruit of righteousness. Brethren, this is what we ought to be striving for, but not striving as a, an impossible attainment. We should be seeing in ourselves, as Paul is praying here for these Philippians, and he's here with us today, sharing his message with us similarly. You cannot show fruits of righteousness if you do not have a righteous tree, if you don't have righteous branches, if you don't have righteous buds, righteous flowers. We think that Christianity is a nice thing to profess. But God is looking at us to see the manner of fruits we bear in the Caribbean, I'm sure wherever there is a lot of agricultural development, they tell you when a tree is not bringing forth fruit, like that fruit that Jesus came upon and was not bearing, when he came back it was still barren, the word said he cursed it, didn't mean he used bad language, he just pronounced it, gone, and God comes to us. And he expects to find fruits of righteousness. And you're telling him, I can't be a fruit of righteousness. My soil isn't well fertilized. My roots aren't deep enough. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Can we look forward this year coming brethren, to see righteous fruits coming from you? You cannot have righteous fruits if you're not based and bound in righteousness. Do you strive to attain righteousness? Or are you content with filthiness? Or are you content with piddling around the, the edges? Staying near to the shore? Just get your feet wet. What did Jesus say to the disciples? He is saying to us through Paul, launch out into the deep. You need to launch out. You, we need to launch out into the deep. That we might be able to accomplish the purpose that God has intended it for his people. God is coming back to take righteous people to himself. And the Calvinistic flippant view is, well, he is all righteousness. You know, I'm no good. I'm a good for nothing. But he is righteous. And that sounds doctrinally correct, but it isn't. God expects us to be filled with the fruit of righteousness now and to manifest them. Which are by Jesus Christ. Lost my faith. <clears throat> unto the glory and praise of God. Have you ever thought that you're living to the glory and praise of God? Keep God as you are today get glory from your life. I know you'll say, but well, he's to give me glory. Yes. But if he gives you his Holy Spirit, what can be more glorious? And he expects of you be putting forth a glorious righteous fruit. Paul says to us this morning, brethren, we've got to be able to bear the fruit of righteousness. If we've been infused by God's Holy Spirit, which is the power of God, which enables beautiful growth, 
excellent footage and excellence from us. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that, that could be a problem. Are we understanding? Are we understanding what we're doing or are we just making a, a veil, vague profession? You should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have turned out, fallen out, rather, unto the furtherance of the gospel. Remember, Paul is beaten several times. This is included in what he's saying here. The things that happened to me, the things that we complain about, have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. We are so quick to complain. <clears throat> we are so quick, quick to blame others. We are so quick to be carnal and not manifest the spirit of Christ. But he said, the things that have happened to me, rough as they were, bad as they could be concluded to have been, have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Could he be referring to his imprisonment? We see that as a, a tragedy. How could the Apostle Paul be imprisoned? Could it be that it could have been God's way of getting to the prisoners in there? To the jail keepers? He makes men and entrances to his jail keepers. Could it be that that's why he said, it has fallen out unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. He carried with him his chains in prison as a bond or as a badge of honor. Because God was using his imprisonment that the gospel that he preached could reach to those who seem unreachable even in prison. Verse 14 And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds Is that possible? How could the brethren wax confident because he is in bonds, stocks, chains on his hands and his legs? My brethren wax confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. If Paul could be imprisoned, the brethren said were inspired with confidence to speak on their level. The word of God without fear. Then he says, Some indeed preach Christ even to envy and strife. I guess that's one of the reasons there's so many different denominations. Strife, envy. Everybody wants to argue. My point is right. I am right. That's not what it means. He said, Some preach Christ to envy and strife. And some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not what they seem to be a Babylon of contention. Everybody is right. Everybody knows what he's doing. Everybody is inspired by the same God. So says he. What is the fruit? The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely. Is it possible that someone can be preaching Christ not sincerely? Some could be doing it for filthy lucre, for worldly gain, for notoriety. It says not sincerely. Supposing to add affliction or affection to my bone or bonds. But the one 
of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. There is no greater defender of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it seems to be, the Paul. That's what we have got to be, brethren, defenders of the truth of God. There is no need for us to flinch and fade and slunk away because of the gospel we preach. We have the only truth, the only light, the only salvation that mankind needs, Paul says. I must preach the word of God, for without him there is salvation in none other than in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Paul speaks to us. Are we listening? What then? Notwithstanding, every way, every form, every fashion, whether in patience or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, ye, and will rejoice. No matter what happens, we confuse the atmosphere with all sorts of wrong doctrines and wrong points of view. So I preach Christ, and I'm content and satisfied that Christ is preached. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I'm sure we understand, brethren, that the Spirit of Jesus Christ is the Spirit of God. They both, Father and Son, work with the power of the Holy Spirit. Donna Trinity, the Father, the Son, and they work with the operating power of God's Holy Spirit. And that does not diminish in any way the power of God's Spirit. For it is by that power that we are made in the likeness of God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son. Then he goes on to speak about the earnest expectation and my hope that, is in, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also in Christ. So be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. No matter what it is, let Christ be magnified, yea, manifested in our body that he might get the supreme glory and honor and praise. Listen to the depth of this man's commitment in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ. Is that your commitment to God's way of life? Or are you still looking for something better? You still think that over there is better than over here? Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What an aspiration. What a contented attitude. What a commitment to the way of God. As far as I'm concerned, said he, as long as I live, I'll be living for Christ. But if I die, I'll be the one who gain because I will be with Christ. If I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't know. That's what what not means. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to, de to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, that was his assessment, to be with Christ is far better. Nevertheless, 
to abide in the flesh, not the carnal attitude in this frame, this physical frame, is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. In other words, I'll stay around as long as God would have me so to do. The furtherance of your joy and your faith. God has us here for a, for a purpose, brethren. We are supposed to bolster each other. We are supposed to make each other better understanding men. That's why we can't hate one another. That's why we cannot be so easily convinced to believe something that's not right about somebody else. We're here to fulfill each other's joy and fulfill each other's confidence in the way of God. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation, conversation is we're living, your manner of living is known as a conversation, not particularly verbal, be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. In other words, the way we live should be becoming to the gospel of Christ. Are you a product of the gospel of Jesus Christ? With that attitude? With that spirit? With that manner? With that behavior? Assess that for yourself. Get whether I come and see you or else be absent. I may hear of your fears. <laughs> that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's quite a position to take on the brethren. No matter what, no matter where I am, you should be of one mind. Are we of one mind here today, brethren? Or are we a bunch of contentious folks pulling and grabbing? You heard of the crabs in the barrel? The hunter for crabs goes along with a bag or a barrel and he catches each crab, but of course we don't eat crab in God's church, you know that. Or oh, you didn't know that. No, you don't, know, I'm sorry. <laughs> the crabs that are assembled in the barrel or the bag, barrel more so because the barrel has smooth sides, they're all crabbing. I quite a joke. They're crabbing, crawling, snarling, all trying to get out of this barrel. But the more they, 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 they scratch on the side, the sharp claws keep causing them to slide right back down. Not only that, but those who are not able to crawl and snatch and grab to get up there, he who tries to get up the side of the barrel <laughs> is easily and quickly pulled back down by the vicious carnal others that are in the barrel. That's what this thing is, carnal. If I can't get up there, you better not try to get out of here. <laughs> That seems to be a prevailing attitude among God's people. If I can't live a life that's putting out good fruit, I'm not going to let you live a life that's putting out good fruit. I will be a torment in your side, always saying something about you to get you angry, get you mad, yet you just live in that kind of state. Verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf or on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. <clears throat> we don't like that part about suffering. Paul says to Timothy, Yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not might, 
shall suffer persecution. And yet you get so irritable when it seems as though you're under persecution by your boss on the job, by your child who would not do what you tell him to do. Persecution, deprivation, difficulty and hardship are a part of the Christian walk. It is for us to know where we can rely and whom we can rely on when these pressures come to us. Undoubtedly, Christ is our reliance. Christ is our fortress. Christ is the one upon whom we depend to bring us out of a difficult time. But he says clearly, all that would live godly, that's a prerequisite. If you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. You read the brethren and people in so many countries suffer hardship, persecution. Was it a week or two ago? The Christian community might just be caught Christians in Egypt. The house of worship was bombarded by hooligans, those who hated what they were doing, went into their house of worship and started shooting the congregants. Those who tried to get away by running outside of the confined area, there was a group of men out there with guns, similarly waiting for those who sought escape. I me of Jones Town in Guyana. Jones had the people break the poison under the authority of those that had weapons. What were those weapons doing there? <laughs> if this was supposed to be a place of worship. We have to keep our eyes open. You don't let leaders cover you with nonsense and stupidity ringing that place were men standing with guns and each person in that congregation was commanded to take a gulp of this poison. They knew it was poison and then just go over there and lie down. When the pictures came back to us we could not believe what we were seeing. It was 900 and some people who drank that poison and had comfortable taken place where they would die under the brutal rulership of Jim Jones. Thank God we have freedom in this country and our understanding of God's truth. We're not coerced. We're asked. We begged. We're told to submit to Jesus Christ. No guns, no weapons here. This should be voluntarily. I love God. And this is where God's truth is promulgated. I take my time and come here on a Sabbath morning to listen to the word of God. God promises that the time will come when it would not be that easy. When it would be perilous. Not saying that rejoicing, not saying that with happiness in my mind. That's what God promises. Having the same conflict which you saw in me. I didn't know that Paul was conflicted. And now here to be in me. So Paul was not conflicted over following God. But he had many places to go visit. And he was tempted to want to go and want to stay. He said, it's needful for you that I stay here and do the work that I've been commissioned to do. Chapter 2. Thank God that Paul is with us and is speaking to us. It is for us to listen to his voice. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded a couple of months ago, I gave a sermon on carnal mindedness or Christ mindedness. 
He's saying here, be filled with my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love. Again, he's banging on that word love. Many who leave, go somewhere else, say, oh, there's no love there. I don't know what you're giving out, but I'm giving out the love of God in my mind and in my life. I am manifesting it as best I possibly can. The like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. Wasn't that the attitude displayed on the day of Pentecost? The Bible said they were of one accord. One accord means commonality. There was singleness of drive and purpose. Singleness of aspiration. They all wanted the kingdom of God to come. They were one mind. And brethren, we in God, church of God, strive daily to be one mind. Not pulling and tugging, but determined to stay in the place where God has called us to. Not with a critical mind, not with a contentious spirit. Be one mind. One accord. When you find your attitude toward God's work and God's people is contentious, conflicting, look internally. Can I be the problem? Am I the one with the problem? Paul is saying to us today that we should be of one accord, collaborative, of one mind. He's not done. Look at verse 3. Paul speaks to us, brethren. I hope listening. Let nothing say that again, repeat. It's for emphasis. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Are you a strifeful person? Are you seeking your own glory? Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Are you looking for glorification while you're still veiled, trapped in the flesh, but in lowliness of mind? That's humility, brethren. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other Rather than themselves. What kind of poor grammar huh? should be for himself, not himself. Who should strive to or do you ever think that XYZ is better than you and deserves elevation? Or do you get envious and somebody else is given elevation? Let nothing be drawn through strife of in glory, brethren. But let each esteem the other better than himself. Do you think of me better than you? <laughs> Do I give you the same accolade and acquiescence and, 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 and space, opportunity to get what I have gotten? That's the Christian spirit. That's the love of God. We're going to come to that shortly. Look not every man on his own things, pride, but every man also on the things of others. You see your brother destitute, you try to help him. Ha ha ha. But if he's of a carnal man, he says, I don't want anything from you. <laughs> that type of carnal spirit dominates. I, 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 you don't have to give me anything. I'm good. Do you see where Paul is coming from? Speaking to the Philippians, but he's speaking to us here on Rocco Bay Boulevard. The power of verse 5 is, is clear. This is the objective of this long conversation. Let this mind be in you, which is also 
in Christ Jesus. Do you have the mind of Christ, brethren? Are you striving for it? Or you feel unworthy? I can't be like Christ. Some folks are so glad to tell you how. I'm not perfect. I'm not that humble. I'm not that good. He came to make us good. He's coming again for a holy people. Not going to be made holy while he's on his way down here to earth. All of a sudden we get holy. That's all as hypocrisy. We've got to be striving for holiness and wholeness, completeness, thoroughness. Can you understand, brethren, to let this mind, the compilation of everything we've talked about this morning that was positive and good, let that mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, when he was reviled, He revived not again. Is that us? No, we try to come back with a stronger punch. Somebody says something about us and we want to flatten him. We want to destroy him. When he was reviled, he revived not again. So Paul is saying to us this morning, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who, verse 6, being in the form of God, God has form. It's in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. But God has form. That he's made us like himself. God must have a head. Toes, hands, torso, who being in the form of God, we were created like He is. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Remember, this was Christ on the earth. He thought it not robbery. Not a dumb idea to be like God. You tell somebody that you're striving to be like God and they say, ah, you can't be like God. Christ, while he was on earth in human form, thought it not robbery. Being like us, like us, to be equal with God. Verse 7. But made himself, which we should do, which is a verbose declaration is what we should be like, made himself of no reputation. In other words, who am I? I am nothing. Christ in me is everything. And took upon him the form of a servant. Can you serve others with a good attitude? Well, you're too good for that. I'm not doing that. The popular song a couple of months ago, I'll do this, I'll do that, but I ain't doing that. Whatever the writer had in mind. It. But for us, anything it takes to demonstrate the spirit of Jesus Christ, any and everything it takes to show that Christ is living in me. No wonder the story of the Good Samaritan resonates wherever it's told. Took up the man that was beaten and bruised and accommodated him and paid the innkeeper. When he comes back, if I owe aught beyond what I'm giving you, I'll pay it. Are we quick to help others? Oh, he's a drunkard, he's a dope. Take her. I'm not going to give my good money to him. That's generally the attitude that we show when we meet somebody that's less fortunate, less blessed than us. We get on a high horse. 
in the gents. Fly away, drive away. Check upon him the form of a servant as is made in the likeness of men. And being found, it says verse 8, in a fashion of, as a man, he humbled himself. How much more humility can Christ show? How much humility he expects of, of us? We are so pompous and so sophisticated and so great and so willing to boast of how bright we are on what we know. In essence, we are not showing that we know much about Jesus Christ, his command, and his expectation of us. He humbled himself. We are too big to be humble, brethren. Look what I have. Look what God has given me. Look how I have become great. And became obedient. He took that word out of the marriage contract. Obey my husband. <laughs> Not me. Conversely, too many men are so proud that they would not say that, yeah, I, I do that. Marriage is such a give and take that you've got to be willing to do what your wife says, uh, not all the time. But at least share her point of view and assess them properly before you dismiss them. Christ and his father had arranged that they would make salvation accessible to all human conception. One of the reasons God frowns on abortion. Because conception means here is someone else that can inherit eternal life. And you and your pomposity, I don't want this child. Sound like Pharaoh. Get rid of those, those children. Get rid of it. He humbled himself, himself rather, even to death. The death of the cross, and that's ignominy. It was ignominious to die on the cross. He lifted up for the world to see above the heads of those who are standing tall in their own right, the human level. There you are on the cross. When I went to school, I don't know if they did it here in this country, when you did not know your lesson, Teacher would give you a couple of wax. Can't do that today. <laughs> Call abuse. Is there any wonder we have such a, an abused and decadent generation? No corporal punishment. But after giving you a couple of wax in your hand or on your behind, the teacher would say, Now you stand up on that desk. <gasps> and all of a sudden, you who are four foot five, standing above the class and everybody can see oh 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 look where he is elevation on the cross was not elevation it was humiliation and jesus came to the earth and humbled himself obediently even unto the death of the cross. Why would God choose such a method to have his son ignominiously displayed for the world to see on a cross? Just about naked. As I said, and when you shall see him, you shall not desire him. Somebody said to me once, do you all, do you all, you know, in derision, was saying it, do you all um, preach the blood? Yeah, we preach to that. You are always in the Old Testament. The old reveals what's coming in the new. And by despising on their part the Old Testament, they're despising the, the premise 
on which the coming Christ would stand and bring salvation to all generation, all mankind everywhere. And so he said, and they all preach the blood in a sense, in a sort of a self-righteous you all talk about uh, Passover. That's for the Jews. <laughs> That's not for the Jews, brethren. That's God. Passing over. Looking over our sin. Not with a wink. I'm going to let it happen anyway. No! God's passing over our sin. Because of the death of the Lamb. And in New Testament terms, he became sin for us who knew no sin. Doesn't end there. Paul goes on to say that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. My friend, God has gone the gambit to manifest his love for us. We keep Passover. <laughs> Who instituted Passover? The very God that people look down and oh, that's for the Jews. No. The Passover, who Jesus became, is God's extended love for us. And we have from now till March, April to prepare ourselves, our hearts, our minds, and our lives for the worthiness of the Lamb of God that were slain from the very foundation of the world. That's another verse. Verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. What's in the name? Shakespeare? He's given him a name that's above every name. That's at the name of Jesus. Some people, when they hear that, they want to bomb and act silly. Jesus didn't have to tell people throughout Israel, oh, get up, you don't have to bow. It's only me. But people, when they hear the name Jesus, they, they catch a sort of a semi dimmy sort of a false display of being filled with something. Paul says, the yeah, Lord's many and God's many. So he made himself of no reputation. And as a result, God has given him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every name, that's prophetic, brethren. That doesn't mean you should have a sudden urge to genuflect. The time will come when every name shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The time will come, brethren, when every proud knee, every proud heart will bow To Jesus, the Son of God, who brings us salvation and who has allowed us today to hear from Paul the same truth as he shared in the Philippians that God in the person of Jesus Christ will return. And when he does, in his own prophetic time, Every knee shall bow, bow, and every tongue will confess. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, that's hypocrisy, be the same always, not only in his presence, but now in his absence, though we had him come and speak to us this morning, But now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Brethren, the onus is on us 
Now that we've received the admonition of Paul, that we humble ourselves and be like Jesus Christ, who seeks to reign and rule not in our hearts, in us, that we might become partakers of his divine nature and eventually to become occupants of his kingdom and reign and rule with him forever and ever. Amen.